Welcome to Godsplaining, contemplative preachers, contemporary age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Hi, and welcome to Godsplaining. This is Father Bonaventure, and I am joined by Father Patrick Mary Briscoe, um, who is the senior editor, if this is correct, of Alatea, which you also may be familiar with. And if you haven't checked out, a wonderful news source and reflection on spiritual life and all of that. Um, I'm sure he'll say things about that. I am a uh, CUA candidate in, uh, CUA doctoral candidate in philosophy um, here in Washington, D.C., and Father Patrick also lives in Washington, D.C. now at the House of Studies. So we're coming from the same place, although as you can tell, we're not in the same rooms. Um, that's just how things go. But Father Patrick, how are you? I'm great. I, I, Father Bonaventure, I think that you're downplaying yourself. You are more than just a graduate student. And I, I think that you need to that you need to figure out uh, that you need to found, figure out a bigger way to present this. You know, oh, I'm just a doctoral okay. candidate try in, this. in philosophy. I'm Father Bonaventure. I am a Dominican um, candidate, doctoral candidate in philosophy at CUA. So that's good. So I'm a Dominican, oh, graduate, Dominican wow. graduate student. Look at that. <laughs> really, really went full there. There, there. there it is. The the grandeur of the life. Yeah, things are good. Um, you know, October being the month of the Holy Rosary. Um, you know, I, I want us to th- want us to think about that. My first assignment um, was to St. Pius V Parish in Providence up there in Rhode Island. Um, I just moved down from Providence to D.C. over the summer. And so as we as we approach uh, uh, October here, as we consider about um, as we consider Our Lady of the Rosary, we think about all these different historical things that tie into that. And I'm feeling a little nostalgic about it. You know, I love yeah, Saint Pius V. That guy grew on me, you know. Well, you know, that's that's this is an important point. Um, when you go to parishes, like when I go and preach at a parish or do a missions or, mission or something, or if I'm assigned somewhere, or if I'm even doing a retreat at some place, I assume that the saints kind of haunt their places. They like their they like their locations that have that are they're patrons of. So, uh, when you're at a if you're at a parish, if you're at Saint Leo the Great, for instance, or something, it might be the case that Saint Leo has particular care of you. And you might want to think and read about him or something. Or if you're at St. Paul's or something, or St. Peter's, or as uh, Father Patrick Mary was at St. Pius V in Providence, Rhode Island, um, you get a chance to really know your know the patron saint of that, because I think it's not like he's a ghost wandering around. Um, but he has some kind of special care and attention. This is dedicated to him in a way that I think there is an intercession there that's helpful. So I always try to preach um, using the words of, of the saints if I'm at a particular place. And you grow attached to those saints, I think, that you're assigned to because you're kind of, mm. it's kind of their house, at their house, really. So you're just there, like, attending as guests. Yeah, that's right. In Rome, um, when I was, uh, I was traveling uh, in Europe a couple years ago for a family wedding, and my parents and I passed through Rome. And I got to see a few things that belonged to St. Pius V. And that, that was really exciting to me. So, like, seeing a cassock that he wore and slippers that he wore and places where he stayed. And then... Yeah. I went to Santa Maria Maggiore and a friar actually opened the front of his tomb for me there in the church. And I was able to pray before his body. He's along there. Wow. Lying in safe. Holy vest is very incredible. Usually the glass case is closed. Um, but uh, that, that was moving. It was like meeting a friend. It was, it was wild. And of course, St. Pius, St. Pius V, as some people might know, is a Dominican uh, pope. Uh, one of four. Jesuits have one. We have four. I don't know how many Franciscans have. Do they have any popes? I don't think they're allowed to. It's hard to say. Know. Maybe they do. They'd, they'd give. They'd give everything away. It's too risky. We should look it up. We're tied with them with doctors, I believe. But um, but uh, popes, popes, I think we're in the lead. Although probably, I'm sure Benedictines or some other thing has has more. Um, we'll, time to check that out. This is why God's playing podcasting. You're kind of just doing stuff. So the fact checking. We raise more box. questions than we ever provide answers to, which is the important thing, you know. Yeah, but talk, situating but though. Getting to our topic, which actually we have been. You might have thought, oh, I thought they were going to talk about Lepanto and Father Patrick's excited about Father, uh, Saint Pius V and the Rosary. And what does that have to do with a Navy battle? Um, of course, you probably do know that it does have something to do with Navy battle. But this is the 450th anniversary of one of the greatest sea battles. Uh, the last, I think, uh, that was fought in, with galleys, so this is, you know, rowing, basically, um, mm. in, in the, well, Lepanto, not quite, quite there, but in the Mediterranean, you could say, uh, 450 years ago, on October 7th, uh, which is a feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, which uh, has to do with Pius V. So, Father Patrick, could you tie in Pius V, the Rosary here, and the Battle of Lepanto just briefly before we get into actually talking about uh, the battle itself, maybe? 
Yeah, that's right. So for listeners who don't know, here's a little bit of a historical context. Like Father Bonaventure was saying, um, the Battle of Lepanto is a naval battle, right? So we have to we have to be thinking the sea. Um, it happened in 1571, which is during the reign of Pope Pius V. So Pius V is elected Pope, and he's he's famous for lots of different things, but probably most famous for actually this battle. Um, what are the other parts of his legacy? Well, he uh, reformed the Roman the Roman rite. So the Trinity Mass was all kind of curated under him. He issued a new breviary. He worked to reform. Uh, the Roman, the Roman Curia. So, uh, so there's a lot of talk about reform under Pius V. Why reform? Well, because in 1571 the church was in crisis, right? So we're we're in the middle of um, the throes of the Protestant Reformation. The Council of Trent was opened um, several decades before and wasn't concluded actually uh, for for some time. Uh, sometime thereafter, those of you that know the history of the Council of Trent, it's a it's kind of a long and involved event that didn't really provide an answer to. Uh, to Protestant objections in a succinct way. I mean, it sort of worked these things out over, uh, over, over the years. Um, so, so the, the church is really in the throes of crisis and Pius V has worked to reform many things. And in the middle of this, you have, you have the, uh, you have the, the pressure of the, uh, of the Turkish, the Ottoman Empire coming up and, and beginning to dispute, um, the Western powers for control over the Mediterranean. So that's a that's a lot going on, just a kind of, yeah, lot it's of a-, a lot of things swimming in the sea, so to speak. It's a real, yeah. It's it's a it's a real mess. Um, Catholicism is it's counter counter Reformation time, and Catholicism, thanks to the Jesuits, is taking back territory and getting new territory, and kind of catching up with after after the first Lutheran kind of revolt, kind of making sense. And Pius V, of course, produces the Catechism, so the succinct kind of kind of Catechism Council of Trent, which is a beautiful succinct document that many of you might even have, um, which is a precursor to the ninety four ninety four Catechism of John Paul II. Um, so things are being done. There's there's been a return. The the church is getting its legs again after a bit of a blow, um, and uh, it's dealing with Protestantism. But this is like a two front war thing because you have, of course, the Ottoman Empire uh, and the Turks who are taking Constantinople before. I mean, and are pushing t- over towards uh, Rome, such that this is another assault on not just Catholic Church but like Western. Western civilization in general, the Turks don't really care that much about um, whether they're wh- whether they're taking over Protestant land or Catholic land. They're just they want it all, um, and so this is a moment which is interesting because it's a unification, you could say, of right. some of the of of Christian Western Christendom. It's the first you maybe want to say large scale um, unification of Christendom after the Reformation to deal with an external enemy or a threat, you could say. That's right. That's right. And it's, it's so, it, so Pius V is such a central character because he's the one who does this. He, he brings the Holy League together. Does the Pope really actually have the power to do this um, at the time? No, he, do, he, he doesn't. <laughs> the, the, other, the other kings, the other lords, the other political powers at, at, at bay at the time are, are not going to just cede this power to the Holy See. So, so that Pius V was able to, to be the front man, to, to bring everyone together, to form uh, what will be known as the Holy League, um, to, to marshal this great naval force. That in itself is already a kind of incredible thing because of how fractured uh, the Christian West had become um, for, for political reasons and for religious reasons, uh, like as we've been discussing with the Reformation. So that in and of itself, like we can't miss that, that Pius V is at the very center of this, that he's, that he, he's the one who calls together the Holy League and that the other, uh, the other political forces allow him to do so it is quite remarkable. Yeah, and so let's, um, some of you might be familiar with this, uh, listeners, through the poem by G.K. Chester in Lepanto, um, mm-hmm. which Father Gregory Pine, I'm sure, loves and uh, um, would love to have talked about as well. But I think he can recite most of it. Um, but um, me not being a gigantic Chesterton fan, but though, although I read this poem and I thought, well, that's just not bad. Um, so, but <laughs> there it's... Uh, that's you know, the same as a compliment from Father Bonaventure listeners. Yeah, that's all you know, right. Not it's bad. Right. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite good. But it focuses on the characters, in a sense, involved in this thing. So um, the kind of key character... Well, there's a couple characters, but maybe... Father Patrick, do you want to take us through some, who are some key characters in this, which are interesting uh, in terms of how you, so a one person in particular, you might not have thought had been a part of this uh, war, but was. Yeah, that's right. So there are a couple of sneaky people. So, so for history's sake, one of the first people that we have to focus on, right, is Don Juan of Austria. 
and he's the commander. He's the head of the Holy League. Um, he's the the admiral that's overseeing this uh, this naval collaboration. Um, he is actually the illegitimate son of the Holy Roman Emperor at the time. Um, so his his rise is already a kind of interesting thing um, in and of itself. But he's able to he's able to effectively lead uh, lead this group, the Holy League, which includes the papal states under Pius V, Habsburg Spain under Philip II, the Republic of Venice, the Republic of Genoa, uh, the Knights of Malta. So we've got all all these other all these other little powers uh, that are that are brought up into this thing. They give a ship or two or several hundred men, right? Um, but but Don Juan of Austria brings all of this together uh, in part because he is so well trusted by the Habsburgs. Which is interesting. So again, the context for this is that the Ottomans keep coming up um, and threatening and threatening the West um, in various battles. We could think the Battle of Vienna, uh, not the famous one that happens in the 17th century, but there's a siege of Vienna in 1529, or the fact that the Knights Hospitaller are driven from the island of Rhodes in 1522. So there's all these kind of looming threats, and all these all these powers have been involved in various ways uh, in these smaller battles. But Don Juan of Austria brings them all together and commands this whole fleet. And Chesterton really focuses on him as a, as a kind of Christian hero in, in his uh, recounting of the battle. Yeah, and there's, there's also, um, we should make, uh, for those of you who are listening and you're military fans or something, this is an interesting turning point. Not only is it the last battle, I think, but a serious naval battle between galleys, so um, a rowing kind of thing. Um, but actually, it is the... It is actually also the kind of transition to a new kind of naval vessel. Um, mm. the, 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 there were galleys, of course, which are little boats with rowing things. But the, also, the, the Holy League has these things called galasses, I think they're called. Um, that's right, yeah. And that's, a con that's like, you could say it's maybe one of the first, I mean, first whatever, but a proto-battleship or something. Um, because yeah. this is a, or a big, you know, a big cannonade ship. It's a, it's a galley merchant kind of larger vessel that then they can load a ton of, of artillery on. Um, they were so, massive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big plat, basically like, I don't know if you've ever been on, I've had the chance, if you haven't been down to, uh, uh Norfolk or other place and stepped on a, uh, a real battleship, one of the Iowa, I think they're Iowa class, uh, battleship, one of those, one of those big four that we had in World War II, um, it's just a big gun platform. I don't think you realize this when you're looking at pictures of it, but you're on there. It's like everything on that battleship is designed for ammunition and as a platform for those three big, big guns. Uh, and these, this is what these, these ships were, these large, they were just gun platforms as opposed to kind of quickly moving galleys or something that had arrows or, in our case, we used muskets on this. But this was the first time that this kind of happened, and that changed a lot about how you, you fought naval wars at this point. You now had platforms of artillery. Um, and that, so that's an, one of the interesting points about the battle itself from military history. Yeah, that was a float. Those things are floating fortresses and the Ottomans hadn't seen them until the Republic of Venice shows up with them at this fight. So it completely, completely took the Ottoman Navy by surprise. Now the Ottomans, of course, had the advantage, like they had a larger naval force, um, and, and they had a kind of strategic advantage because they were the ones that chose the engagement, right? So this battle didn't have to happen. They were kind of taking refuge there in the harbor in Lepanto, which is off the shores of Greece. Okay, if you don't know where this is, um, the the Ottomans decided to sail out of the Gulf and to engage the Holy League. Um, the the reasons why they sailed out are complicated and debated by military historians. People that know a lot more about this stuff than I do, but um, it, it seems that the reason they engaged was because of an order that came from the Sultan um, that was responding to older information, right? So you think of like the delay of how it would have, how long it would have taken to get uh, an instruction from Istanbul about when to engage or not, right? So, so the data that was given to the Sultan, all the information um, uh, was delayed. And basically it seems that the Sultan, um, the Sultan would have made a different decision had he had more accurate information about the fleet that the Holy League had marshaled. Um, but even still, the, the Ottomans had the advantage, which is why the Christian victory is a surprise. Yeah, the num the numbers were certainly on theirs, and the um the Christians had a had more artillery, you could say, because these these ships, and also they they were using muskets as opposed to bows in a way. Um, but also, it's, so you could say, oh, well, maybe they actually was kind of an even thing, but it was a scorching victory. Um, and even and any mil mil military historian, and I've just read a little bit about on these sort of things, shows that the str the strategy used by Don Juan and how he was able to hold the lines in various places and avoid outflanking by the Ottoman fleet. 
shows that it's it wasn't just the the pure weaponry, pure firepower that that did this, but uh, skill and strategy and uh, enthusiastic command over this this one man, uh, Don Juan of Austria, who um, again was yeah an Ill- the illegitimate son of Charles V, the emperor. So it's kind of like. Um, it's kind of like the genealogy in uh, in Matthew, right? No, Luke, right. where you have the Luke, where you have the the, the you know these these yeah, questionable. There's questionable people on that line there. It's not their fault particularly, but they're not the normal people you would expect in the genealogy, um, and yet uh, they're they're a part of the plan. So Don Juan has this this kind of aspect as well to him. He's not a great hero, but comes from strange backgrounds. But God uses strange instruments. But that gets onto the the meaning of this because we've been talking about some history and this sort of thing. We want to talk about, well, so what? You know, history is fun, but it's got to mean something. So we're going to take a quick break here. And after the break, we'll talk about maybe as we celebrate Lepanto, uh, celebrate um, the Holy Rosary, and celebrate Pius V, like, what's the significance for us? What do we make of it? What, what do we take away from it? So we'll be right back to talk about uh, Lepanto and the 450th anniversary and the Rosary and Pius V. You are listening to God's Planning. Visit us at godsplaining.org to listen to our episodes, shop our store, and donate to our podcast. All gifts go to improving the podcast and bringing the gospel to more listeners. Thanks for your support. And welcome back to God's Planning. My name is Father Bonaventure. I'm with Father Patrick Mary Briscoe, and we are talking about Lepanto, Pius V, and the Holy Rosary, and how these all mesh together. So we talked about the kind of some background about it. Very sketchy. Um, very, I should say our, our job was sketchy, but it's not sketchy background. <laughs> um, and we talked a little about the military, you know, military aspects to it and the interesting historical figures to it. Um, and I want to talk about another, sh- another uh, secret, secret figure of literature that happens in this war, too. We'll get there. But, uh, uh, Father Patrick, what, what, do, what excites you so much about Lepanto? Um, since you spent time with St. Pius V, I could say, in prayer and the rosary. So what, what is, other, this isn't just a historical victory or a military fact or something. Like, what does this mean, do you think, to you uh, and then to, to other people that might be, might be interested? Right. Well, certainly in the time, historically, this victory was a really important moral victory. So for decades, again, you know, as I, I referenced a couple battles at the top of the episode, um, showing how the Ottomans um, and that empire had continued to threaten um, to to threaten Europe. Um, to to have won the Battle of Lepanto was the first major success uh, of of the West in defending itself um, in this particular way. And then the the Battle of Vienna, um, the union between um, uh, the, that's crafted there between the the empire and uh, uh, the Polish uh, Republic is very interesting. So any, anyway, this is a big moral victory. You know, we, t- we talked about the context of this time where Europe mm-hmm. is being more and more fractured. And as Father Bonaventure raised, there's even a question of whether or not this is really a Catholic or a Christian victory. You know, we have uh, people like James uh, VI, the King of Scotland, who wrote one of, these, uh, wrote one of these epic poems celebrating the victory. So there was a sense in which Lepanto was understood as being a bigger victory for Christianity in the Christian West than than something that was just a Catholic victory, which is, I think, interesting to note. Uh, but but for those of us uh, those of us that are that um, that are looking for something for for a, a kind of victory for for a moral victory for for a sense of which to draw um, from something powerful to you know to draw inspiration from in a world where we're constantly feeling defeated. I think Lepanto serves an important spiritual purpose today uh, for us. And it has, I think this is where the rosary ties in too. Um, it reminds us that, uh, and this is the greatness of Pius V, I suspect, is that po- even political events are not merely political. So we have the story of, of him, of course, calling this, uh, calling together this thing and, and, and directing. But he's directing from, from Rome and from a distance away but he's engaged in it in prayer. I mean, he's, he tells That's everyone right. to go and pray, and they're praying the rosary, and he, has this, and he has this vision, this dream, right? He's looking outside. He can't see us, but he's looking outside of his window, famously, and, and then he, he calls to pr- everyone for prayer for celebration because, uh, because he knows they've won. He has this kind of real sense of this, um, uh, it, it, inspiration, you could say. But I think that, that it's not just that Pope... Pius V called this together, the Holy League, and then it's a fight between Christians and the Turks and all of this. 
Uh, and then we won Christendom, what have you, and safe Mediterranean, safe for us for for a little while, and his moral victory. But the fact that he's involved and he's calling all Christendom to be involved in this thing, even though they're not there at that moment, to tie in and pray, and the the reminder that even huge, distant, and even political events can be supported, uh, interceded for, and that there's a direct relationship in that way. When you read the accounts of this you get a sense that Pius V is actually a player in this battle, even though he's just praying the rosary. And they might say, scoff then, say, well, it's just prayer, that doesn't mean anything. But th- I think this is the power of the inter- intercession and the connection with, with us, so that we reminded that even political events and intercessions, we are engaged and we are a part of those campaigns, whatever they might be. And that's right. And I, I think, importantly, the rosary has been described as a weapon, right? A great spiritual weapon. Um, and that the victory uh, of the Battle of Lepanto is analogous to us who are all fighting in the spiritual life, right? Fighting the force of evil in very real ways in our lives. And we see from the political military victory of the Battle of Lepanto, the effect of the rosary, that should encourage us to be faithful to it as we fight the battle against evil in our spiritual lives, right? Um, so the Dominican friar Juan Lopez wrote in his 1584 book on the rosary, that the rosary, uh, the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, or the feast of Our Lady of Victory, that is October 7th, was offered in memory and in perpetual gratitude of the miraculous victory that the Lord gave to his Christian people that day. And this is something that all of us need to claim against this, this power of victory, this intercession of Our Lady, the power of the Lord to intervene in our lives. It, it's, a, it's a power and victory that all of us need to claim as we continue to fight spiritual battles. And I think that the, the, the Battle of Lepanto gives us language to talk about that directly and to give us a sense of the kind of evil that we're actually up against in the spiritual life. Yeah, and I think this is to tie this with some scriptural and church father kind of reflections. So uh, the church fathers, when they're reading the kind of holy wars in, of, of Israel uh, mm. and the campaigns in the Old Testament, for instance, if you read them, they are— they're, you could say, we say spiritualizing them, and they're using these examples about going, taking the promised land uh, and Canaan and, and, and all of this in terms of we, how we fight against evil and how we purify our own, our own, our own spiritual evil lands that, and push out evil and sin and all of this, so that they use the, the physical language and history of, of the Jewish wars, you could say, to, as, an, as a model and as an icon of the spiritual warfare that is to go on, so that it's a type, in the sense that just as there's typology of Christ in the Old Testament, so there's typology and images of spiritual warfare uh, and how we fight against sin in the Old Testament. And in, in an extended way, you might want to say, well, the Battle of Lepanto, so St. Paul was the, an apostle untimely born, is born too late. The Battle of Lepanto is like one of these, one of the, you could maybe think of it as, as one of these religious wars, you know, by the people of God, but that it serves as a type, as, as Father Patrick is talking about, of the spiritual warfare and the, the, the weapons that are fought with that through prayer, especially, um, and the rosary in particular, this sort of thing. So I like that, that, yeah, it's, it's to spiritualize this in a way, and to see it as a, as a model for our own kind of life, because victories are important. You know, we can get run down, and we can think that we're just overwhelmed by, by things, but they actually, there are victories to be had, and great victories to be had. There are conversions, there are changes, there are sea turns um, of, of our spiritual life that can occur through intercession and prayer, and through especially grace. Uh, through miracles, and this is what Lepanto is seen as. So I like that as a physical representation reminder of the spiritual kind of war we can do. Now, one of the one of the most graphic descriptions, because I think we we run the risk, right, of redu- reducing history to a cartoon, and we think like, oh, you know, it's e- it's easy to glorify a naval battle, right, and we overlook like that these are these massive ships ramming against each other. That on on the decks of every one of these galleys, there's one two hundred infantrymen you know, shooting, as we've said, crossbows and blunderbusses, you know, the, the, the kind of firsthand handguns, uh, you know, that all, all of this is very violent. We, we have a firsthand account of this actually given to us uh, in his way by Father Bonaventure's kind of surprise character who is there present at the Battle of Lepanto, um, who is Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote. And he gives there in 
Don Quixote this account of the battle, which is which is just mm-hmm. extraordinary. Um, I you know I, I want to I want to kind of push back on this right and, and figure out how we engage with the fact that this was a, a very violent, bloody battle, and for us as modern people. Uh, we have an understanding of war um, that that is to be resisted at all costs. I mean, that's certainly my <laughs> certainly my own view, right? This is the last of the list of things. Um, so, but Father Bonaventure, for anyone kind of uncomfortable with a with a glorification of the Battle of Lepanto, w- w- what do you think we should say uh, a- as we look back on this event? Yeah, I mean, this is certainly in our today in today's culture where we're trying to rid ourselves of all possible uh, things that impinge on our present sensibilities. Um, I think it's important to remember that they are indeed present sensibilities. Uh, C.S. Lewis called uh, mm. it's called this right. chronological mm. snobbery, uh, the idea that one can assume one that one that one's better than anyone else that's come before you, and two, I would extend that you could understand that you automatically understand everything that's gone before you and such. Now, this battle of Lepanto might be a good case to think about this in that uh, we we think of war. I think as a univocal, which means just kind of one meaning term. So um, <clears throat> when we think of war, what do we think of? Well, we're all downstream of the Great War, not only World War One, but World War Two, And not only World War Two, but nuclear holocaust. Um, so the image of, I think when people think of World War Two, they probably think of, of Nazi flags, but they also probably think of an atomic bomb. And in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we just wiped out tons and tons of people. Incredible, you know. The lives lost in that war, even the Civil War, you can think about. But these modern, Mm -hmm. and moving into modern, but especially, and this is why today, war, I think, is such a vicious thing for us. Not because we don't, because violence is all of a sudden totally bad, and we never, I mean, we defend ourselves and things. But because war has such incredible costs. It is massive, humanity-destroying events um, that is just seem impossible to justify in any way. We have political means. We live in a, a particular world where we talk in, we try to do treaties and this sort of thing. And it's it's so that it seems weird to fight and seems actually immoral to fight any war today. And and rightfully so, I think. Um, just like, for instance, drawing and quartering or any sort of capital punishment in a particularly violent way, we might say we just got other ways to deal with this. But of course, that's not true back in these times. One. The weapons were, again, these are muskets and, and, uh, and crossbows and some cannons. Um, people are dying. Okay, that's, that's certainly happening. And violence and war is not desirable, really uh, justifiable in these situations. But there's, there is no UN. There's no treaties. There's no consciousness of this possibility, really. When you had nations and, and empires struggling with each other, this was their means of politics. War was politics governed by other means. That doesn't mean that every war, obviously, therefore, is justified, just like any political decision today is justified. But it does mean that war for them was a different kind of event. Um, these weren't bloodthirsty people that now were so enlightened and modern, but they were people like us trying to get things done to protect things and change structures. And this was one of their means to do it. And there were plenty of people that survived these battles. It wasn't like the, a nuclear bomb dropped on a city and wiped everyone out. It wasn't. It wasn't like that. There were these were professional. A lot of them were mercenaries, trained people to fight these things. And I think war for us is today is this distant kind of thing. Even when we fight wars today, we don't really do it as a nation. We do it as in special ops and things because it's such a grisly thing at this point. Whereas in that culture, it's a it's a different thing. That doesn't excuse all wars. But it, I think it should bring some perspective mm. on how we mm-hmm. think about this before we kind of rush to judgment on it and its celebration, however we do that. Yeah, one of the things that's so interesting to me about the legacy of Lepanto, right, is that within a year, the Ottomans had rebuilt their fleet and come and taken Cyprus, which was a, a, which was a blow to uh, certain, certainly to the West. Um, but, but the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, the devotion to the Rosary, endures. And so there's there's a there's a a sense of this um, of a kind of deeper spiritual mechanism at work um, through these historical events, I think. And so it's worth to me, it is worth celebrating this day, continuing as the church does to honor October seventh as the feast of Our Lady of Rosary, um, as the feast of Our Lady of Victory, as it's also known. 
um, because of this, because of this, uh, this deeper movement, this devotion to Our Lady, uh, which was a real and impactful uh, and and valid uh, thing in this particular historical moment. And I think too, it's a good reminder for us again, living downstream of of all of this, and in a different different political structure. So we live in liberal democracies in a world where you know religion right. is a private sphere kind of thing. Um, I think Don Juan and others would have found that laughable. And they would have thought, well, you know, when you pray for your, when you, you should be praying for your country, not just saying like, God bless America, but, but you should mean it. And you should be trying to preserve the elements of Christianity and Catholicity that might be involved in your political relationships. So Lepanto not just reminds us about the spiritual warfare aspect, but it does have this kind of political thing to remind us that the privatization of religion is a thing that we do but that would have been very strange and even would have been worth fighting over and and dying over uh the, over this thing so it's a reminder to us to to realize also that um though we might be better in terms of uh, our treaties and better about not having to fight as many wars as you would have been back then we also have given up something too about the vision of a political sphere actually oriented towards god we've made it safer and more tolerable in a sense, but something that they would have also, I think, had had questions about whether this was that we were actually whether we were actually enlightened on this matter, or whether it was actually a bit of a step back for them. So celebrate the day by honoring Our Lady of the Rosary by praying the Rosary. Pick it up, meditate on the mysteries of the life of Christ. Turn to Our Lady for intercession in your own life. Um, thanks for listening to this episode today. We're very grateful. Uh, like and share the podcast. Send it to someone who you think is going to be interested. Although, please, not a military historian. Uh, if you would, uh, if uh, you're one of our benefactors, we're very grateful um, for you supporting our our work here. Um, consider donating to us on our Patreon account. Information about that is available on our website, uh, godsplaining.org. Um, until next time, know of our prayers for you, and please pray for us. God bless. Thanks for listening to God's Planning, a work of the Dominican Friars of the Province of St. Joseph. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave a review on your podcast app and visit us at godsplaining.org.